And where are you from? And who's the one fundamental belief in your life? Jesus. Boy, you make me feel at home. Thank you very much. I appreciate the way that you welcome people of all uh, different kinds. I mean, we've got Manuel up here doing this. I can't even do it. Thank you. And then you welcome a guy like me. I appreciate it. I feel right at home here. Been uh, talking around the campus. I sure appreciate uh, everybody who stopped me and greeted me and talked to me and asked questions. It's wonderful. Speaking of questions, I don't want you to forget that um, tomorrow night and the next night, we're going to look at uh, whatever questions are really on your mind. There's a question box in the back. Yep, it's there. Eddie's holding it up. Paper back there, pencils. If there's something you want to talk about specifically, just let me know, will you? And we'll spend the next couple of nights doing that. I think that might be really fun to see what specific things you want to talk about. Probably more important than if I was choosing all of the nights, so let's do that. Just uh, stop by at the end of the service and uh, write something down or during the day tomorrow, and I'll try my best to give you some answers to your questions the next couple of nights. My wife Karen and I had uh, been planning our wedding for quite a while. Finally, the weekend came when we were going to get married. We were living in Northern California, but we had to drive down to San Francisco to pick up Karen's dad on Friday before the Sunday when we got married, just a couple days ahead of our getting married. And we went down early in the morning, braved the traffic through the Bay Area, down through San Francisco to the airport. And uh, we're there for the 9 o'clock flight that came up from L.A. Karen's dad was supposed to be there on the 9 o'clock flight. And uh, we were all excited to see him. We were driving his car. First time he'd ever let me do that. So I was kind of careful, but we were there on time. 9 o'clock, we were standing at the gate. All the people came off the plane, and he wasn't there. Well, there was a flight at that time every hour on the hour from Los Angeles to San Francisco, so we thought he must have just missed it. He'd be on the 10 o'clock flight, and we waited there at the gate. 10 o'clock, we were all smiles, waiting for him to walk off the plane. He didn't show up. Well, we got a little nervous, made a phone call. He was just doing business, we were told, and he missed the getting to the airport on time, and he'd be there at the 12 o'clock flight. Could we wait that long? Sure. We waited until 12 o'clock, met the people coming out of the plane. He wasn't there. Now, we were, uh, you know, had a lot of things to do before getting married on Sunday, so we, uh, we were nervous. We started making lists of things we had to do when we finally got back, got a little bit of lunch, met the 1 o'clock plane, the 2 o'clock plane, the 3 o'clock plane. He didn't make any of those. Made another phone call. He was sorry he wasn't going to make it today. He'd have to come up the next night. So we had spent all day at the airport. It was now after 4 o'clock. The rush hour traffic is going back the same way we've got to go. So we got in the car at the airport, paid a big parking fee, and then headed out across the Oakland Bay Bridge. And at the time, you had to pay a toll in both directions on the bridge. We got up toward the place where we were going to pay the toll, and I noticed... A, a policeman drive up behind me. I looked at him in the rearview mirror. I started driving real steadily, you know. And then he passed me in the left. Now, you always feel good when that happens. He passed you in the left, and I looked over at him, and, and uh, he didn't look at me. He just kept driving. And then he got ahead of me, and he pulled into the same lane ahead of me. And I thought, well, that was funny. He kind of just did one of those. And then he slowed down, and he came over to this side kind of had done a circle around me, and then he pulled back around behind me again and put his lights on, just as we got to the toll booth. And uh, the guy looked at the policeman, and he said to me, the policeman wants you to pull over in front of all of these people. He had to stop the toll booth, and I had to pull over, and the policeman uh, pulled over, and then he walked up to the car. It was late at night. He didn't look like he was in a very good mood. I had no idea what I was, had done wrong. I, um, I was pretty tired myself from waiting all day at the airport. And he came and he said, you're driving with your high beams on. And I looked down at the dashboard and the high beam indicator was not lit up. And I said, no, it, it says it's not lit up. And he said, get out of the car. 
in that tone of voice. I got out. He, he went into the car, sat down, played with the high beam, and he said to me, your high beam indicator is broken. I'm going to give you a ticket for driving with a high beam indicator that's broken. Boy, I didn't want to mess with this guy. He was rough and tough and big. Kind of like those guys the missionary in Africa had yesterday. Mean and ugly. He fit the whole thing. I said, whatever you say. It's not my car. It's my girlfriend's father's car. But uh, I'll take the ticket and give it to him. He's coming up. He said, another thing. Have you been drinking? You're driving all over the road. I said, I was driving a straight line. How could you say that? I don't even drink. But I tell you what, I've been at the airport all day. The girl and I here are getting married on Sunday. We've been waiting for her father at the airport the whole day. And we're probably pretty tired. By this time, he had my license in his little folder. You know, he started to write and he, he said, you're doing what? I said, I'm getting married Sunday. And we were waiting. At the, he said, stay right here. He walked back up to the car. He stuck his head in the car. And he said to Karen, are you really getting married Sunday? She said, yeah, Sunday, 7 o'clock in the evening. Been waiting at the airport all day for my dad. He didn't show up. He pulled his, his uh, head out of the car. He came back to his car where I was standing now waiting. He took my license and handed it back to me. And he said, get out of here. You're in enough trouble already. <laughs> well, I have a different view of marriage than he did. And I've been in trouble to that same girl for 35 years now. I'm having a good time. Um, speaking of being in trouble, any of you belong to churches where the worship wars are raging these days? Oh boy, all around the world it's the same thing. Worship wars raging in Adventist churches all over the place. And a lot of people are getting upset. A lot of people are getting hurt. A lot of people are confused. People want to worship, but some people say the way you worship isn't any good. People who like to worship the way they want to worship turn their fingers back and say, my worship is fine, your worship is not too hot. Some people are saying, the way you worship is just too alive. And other people are saying, the way you worship is just too dead. And the fingers are going back and the wars are raging. And I'd like to look tonight into a Bible story to try to find a principle of worship that can stop the fighting. I don't really want to talk about uh, music. Did I leave my Bible on the chair right there? Because I don't have it all memorized. Thank you, my dear. I don't want to really talk about worship styles or worship music tonight, if you'll permit me. Something that's on your mind, if that's a question you have, write it down and we'll try to talk about it next couple nights. Tonight I just would like to try to find a biblical principle of worship that would uh, help the worship wars to stop. Okay, if you've got your Bibles, you'd like to turn to 2 Samuel 5. Let's take a look at what the Bible has to say in one particular instance about worship. King David is 37 and a half years old. He's been king for seven and a half years over part of the tribes of Israel. Now Israel is united. They've come to Hebron to make David king over everybody. And there are great festivities happening, a great camp meeting in Hebron. The Bible tells us the kind of food that people brought, how many people are coming, all the kinds of things they were doing to have fun. They were having a great time celebrating that David was now going to be king over united Israel. And at some point in the festivities of the weekend, somebody came to David and said, you know, it would be a good idea now that you're king over all of us if you'd make a speech. What your first speech is king. What do you say? And so David said yes, and he stood up on a rock, and all the people gathered a little bit closer. There were thousands of people there, David raised his voice and he began to talk about what it meant to him to be king. This position that he had been anointed for years and years earlier, and now he was going to be king over all of Israel. He was excited and thrilled to do what uh, the people had asked him to do. And then somebody said, what's the first thing you want to do as king? And he didn't have to think very long. And he said, you know what I'd like to do? I'd like to go to Kiriath-Jerim, 
and bring the Ark of the Covenant to Jerusalem. And there was a gasp in the crowd as people said, why didn't we think of that? That's a wonderful thing. Let's do it. Let's go to Kiriaturim and bring the Ark of the Covenant to Jerusalem. And David said, I want to make the Ark of the Covenant the central place of worship and gathering in the nation of Israel. And I would like to take 30,000 soldiers with me to march up the hill in Kiriaturim and get the Ark of the Covenant. And everybody in the crowd knew exactly why he had picked that number. And they knew exactly what David was referring to. And to find out what he was referring to, you've got to go back 20 years in the history of Israel. And if you want to turn back to 1 Samuel 4, here's the point where David was starting to tell the story and why he chose that number and why he wanted to do what he wanted to do. 1 Samuel 4 is a story about how Eli and his two sons and Samuel lived in Shiloh and the Ark of the Covenant was there. The sanctuary had been set up there. And everybody would come to worship the Shiloh. They'd come together. But there was a war going on and the Israel the Israelite army went out to fight the Philistines at a place called Ebenezer. And the first day of the battle was a terrible one for Israel. Hundreds and thousands of soldiers were killed. And somebody, a leader in the Israelite camp, an elder, the Bible says, said to somebody else, wouldn't it be wonderful if we could get the Ark of the Covenant here in the middle of the battlefield the presence of God in the middle of the warfare we're doing, that would turn us all on and we'd be better fighters and then we'd win the battle. And so they sent back to Shiloh and Hophni and Phinehas, Eli's two sons themselves, brought the Ark of the Covenant to the middle of the Ebenezer battlefield. And as soon as all the Israelite soldiers saw it, they began to shout and yell, God is with us, we're going to win this battle. And in fact, in the Philistine camp, they could hear the shouting going on in the Israelite camp, and they began to be worried. They said, some God has come into their midst. One of the gods that delivered them from the Egyptians and parted the Red Sea, and now we're in real trouble. And they began to try to muster each other's courage. And they said, You've got to go out there and fight like men or we're going to be slaves to the Israelites tomorrow. And in the Israelite camp, they were thinking, well, as long as we've got the Ark of the Covenant here, we're going to be okay. We're not even going to have to fight too hard. This is going to be a wonderful thing to do. Before I want to go, before I go any farther, I would like to suggest that there's some symbolism here that will be helpful to us. For as long as the children of Israel had wandered in the wilderness, the Ark of the Covenant had been at the very center of their encampment. Do you remember the story where the cloudy pillar would go in the morning and everybody would follow the pillar until it stopped and the priests carrying the Ark with the poles on their shoulder would, would march until they were right underneath where the cloudy pillar was and they would stop and they'd put the Ark of the Covenant down there. Remember the Ark of the Covenant had the Ten Commandments in it? It had the uh, bowl of manna that had uh, been preserved miraculously and placed in the Ark. And it had Aaron's rod that had grown branches and uh, leaves and it symbolized that God had chosen uh, Aaron and his, his uh, clan to be the high priests. It was right in the center of their faith. And everything they did was built around that center of their camp. If that is true of what happened in Israel, then I think it would be fair to say, considering what we talked about last night, that Jesus is the very center of everything we do. I think it would be fair to say that the Ark of the Covenant could be a symbol for us of what it means to have Jesus in the center of our experience. What it means to get up every day and follow Jesus wherever He leads us. What it means to to build our lives around this one central unifying principle, Jesus and what He's done for us. The, the everlasting love that God has for us is manifested in Jesus. The enduring grace that will not let us go. The way God pursues us and pursues us until finally we say, yes, Lord, I want You to be at the center of my life too. When we read in the Old Testament about the Ark of the Covenant and 
and how everything centered around that, I think it's fair to say it's a symbol of Jesus in the very center. If you go to the sanctuary system like I did this morning in, in the big tents and talked about every article of furniture in the earthly sanctuary, it all represents Jesus. It's fair to say that this central portion of Israel's life represents what Jesus is in the center of our life. Okay with that? I think it's a good principle that we can follow. And so here we're trying to see what happens when Jesus should be in our midst and when we treat it right. I, I'm going to suggest tonight there's only one way to worship and it has to do with Jesus being in the center. But the wrong way to worship is when we use Jesus for the wrong way. And the Israelite soldiers brought the Ark of the Covenant into the middle of their battlefield, not a spiritual place, but a physical warfare where there was hand-to-hand -hand combat. And the next day they experienced one of the worst defeats that Israel would ever experience in its long history. 30,000 soldiers lost their life that next day. That's why David chose 30,000 people to come back and get the Ark. We'll come back to that. 30,000 soldiers lost their life. And that day when David was first king and he was saying his first speech as king to everybody, there wasn't a single man or woman and child in the, in the congregation that wasn't related to or knew somebody closely that had died 20 years before at the first battle of Ebenezer. Mothers had sons that had died there. Wives had husbands that had died there. Kids had fathers and uncles. There were brothers. 30,000 people was a lot of people to die in one day. And that's what they lost on the second day of the battle, of first battle of Ebenezer. Secondly, the Philistines, emboldened by their defeat of the Israelite army, captured the Ark of the Covenant and took it back to their country. It was the most sacred piece of furniture, the most sacred article, the most sacred thing in Israel's history, and the Philistines now had it in their country. And then a third awful thing happened. Somebody went running from the battlefield back to Shiloh, for old Eli, the high priest, was sitting on a little hill on a bench, wondering what was happening with his sons. They'd taken the ark into the battle. He's 98 years old, he's blind, he's quite heavy now, and a runner comes up and tells him, we've lost 30,000 people, including your two sons. Eli sighed heavily. We've lost the Ark of the Covenant, and at that, he fell over backwards and broke his neck and died. And the children of Israel lost their spiritual father that day as well. One of Eli's daughter-in-laws was about to have a baby and all of the stress and the commotion, she delivered the baby and named him one of the worst names in the Bible story. She named him Ichabod, which means the glory has departed from Israel. And from that day on, they referred to this as the Ichabod defeat. When they lost the people, they lost their spiritual father, but most of all, they had lost the Ark of the Covenant. You remember what happens then in 1 Samuel 5 and 6 and 7. The Ark is in the land of the Philistines for seven months. There's some strange things that happen in the holy places of the Philistines. The people in, in the, the Philistine nation realize after just seven months they do not want this holy piece of furniture in their place. And so they come up with this scheme that what they'll do is build a brand new cart and they'll put the Ark of the Covenant on the cart. And then they took two cows that had just had calves. And they, they took the calves away and they put a yoke on the cows. And they started out the cows in the direction of Israel. And they said, if, if the cows go straight to the first little city in Israel, Beth Shemesh, then we know that God has has been with these people and is really still in the presence of this ark. But if the cows wander here and there, then we know this was just a coincidence that happened to us. And so all of the elders of the Philistines follow the cart with the ark in it, and they follow it back to the borders of Israel. 
And the cows, the Bible say, don't go to the right or the left. They go straight to Beth Shemesh. And there are people at Beth Shemesh who are harvesting their wheat in a field by, uh, that belongs to a man named Joshua. And there's a great big rock by this field and the cows with the cart with the Ark of the Covenant in it stop at this great big rock. And the people in the field realize that the Ark of the Covenant is back. They see it there. And they begin to shout and rejoice God's return, the Ark to us. The Ark has come back after some time away. It's back with us. And they go rejoicing. They pick up the Ark and they put it on the big flat rock that's there. They take the new cart and they cut it into all kinds of pieces and pile the wood together. And then they kill the two cows, sacrifice them as a burn offering on the wood, start the thing fire, and they're all standing around the bonfire praising God and singing hallelujah. The ark is returned. And then a terrible thing happens. You'd think that these people knew enough not to do this. But somebody went over and said, I wonder if the Ten Commandments and the bowl of manna and the, and the rod that budded is still there or did that go back to the Philistines? And they took the top of the Ark of the Covenant off And they formed a line and everybody looked in and 70 people died. Wouldn't you think after the second or third person you'd get the picture, you don't want to look in here? These people were so excited that they started looking in, falling down dead. Next guy in line, look in, fall down dead. 70 people before they finally figure out what's going on. And then the Bible says they were so fearful that they sent to the next town, the same thing that the Philistines had been doing, passing this thing from town to town. They sent to the next town, which is kiriath Jerem, and they got a priest from that town whose name is Abinadab, and they called for him to come get the ark. And the Bible says that, they, that Abinadab took the ark up to his house on a hill in kiriath Jerem, and he took the ark into his house put it there in the living room and shut the door and nobody saw it again for 20 years. Seven months in the land of the Philistine, 20 years in the house of Abinadab on the hill in kiriath Jerem, And that's where it is when David over in Hebron 20 years later says, the first thing I'd like to do is take 30,000 soldiers, go up to the hill, knock on Abinadab's house on the hill in kiriath Jerem, and I want to bring this holy piece of furniture, this thing that's at the center of our faith, I want to bring it to the capital city, and I want to put it in a tent that I've raised in Jerusalem for it, and I want everybody to come back and worship in front of the tent again. And everybody yelled, Hallelujah, that's a wonderful idea. They were ready to do it. And just like that, David put 30,000 people together. They made all the plans. And off they marched from Hebron up to kiriath Jerem, up the hill to Abinadab's house on the hill, knocked in the door. And Abinadab opens the door. And there's your highness, King David, standing at the door. And he says, it's time for the ark to come to Jerusalem. And so they do an interesting thing. They build a cart. And they put the ark of the covenant on the cart. And they get two cows have just had calves and they put the calves somewhere else and they put the yoke on the cows and they begin to lead it down the hill from Abinadab's house in kiriath Jerem, down through the valley up to Jerusalem. Interesting story how it continues. I think you know where we're going with this. First Chronicles 13 is my favorite reading of this. Let's bring the ark back, he said. David assembled all the Israelites. First Chronicles 13, now 5, 6. They moved the ark from the ark of God from Abinadab's house on a new cart with Uzzah, remember that name? And Ahio guiding it. Verse 8, David and all the Israelites were celebrating with all their might before God, with songs and with harps, and lyres, and tambourines, and cymbals, and trumpets. And when they came to the threshing floor of Kidon, Uzzah reached out his hand to steady the ark, because the oxen had stumbled. The Lord's anger burned against Uzzah, and he struck him down because he had put his hand on the ark. And so he died there before God. Somebody ran back up the hill. There was a distance between the people and the ark, 
I ran back up the hill and said, uh, King, we've got a little situation developing down here on the floor of the valley. I need to come down and look at this. And so David catches up with the ark. He comes there. There's Uzzah dead. You know, my friends, I have to admit that year after year I would read that story and I get to that point and I just shut my Bible. I didn't understand it. I didn't like it. I kept thinking, poor Uzzah just reached up to try to make sure the ark wasn't going to tumble on the floor of the, of the, uh, the pathway there. And somehow it made God mad. A couple years ago, I had the wonderful responsibility of choosing which of the Bible stories would be included in the new children's Sabbath school curriculum for the General Conference. Spent two years of my life reading every story in the Bible, getting paid to read every story in the Bible, trying to figure out which ones needed to be studied by children, which times. One of the best two years of my life. Somewhere along the line, I knew I had to look at this study, this story. I had to figure it out. I had to try to understand it. See if it was a story that could be included in children's Sabbath school lessons or not. And I began to read it like I'd never read it before. I didn't know about the 20 years in, in uh, Abinadab's house on the hill in kiriath Didn't know about that. I read both of the, the accounts in... Uh, in uh, 1 Chronicles 13 and in 1 Samuel, 2 Samuel. And then I came to this story. I had been reading it in 1 Chronicles and I came to it in 2 Samuel 6 and I discovered two things that I had never seen before. In 2 Samuel 6, it says that, that Uzzah's action, it calls Uzzah's action an irreverent act. Lord's anger burned against Uzzah because of his irreverent act. The Bible doesn't explain what it meant to be irreverent. I don't know that we have a good definition of what it means to be irreverent. There are some things that you do or that I do that other people might think is irreverent that we don't think it is. I don't know that it's entirely subjective. Certainly there are things that all of us would consider irreverent. Something that Uzzah did. The Bible's not clear. I don't know what it was. It was more than, than out of kindness, reaching up, hoping the ark would not fall. It was more than that. The Bible simply says it was an irreverent act. And, and I've decided we're going to have to accept the Bible's word. It was an irreverent act, whatever it was. He was treating this holy thing in a way that it should not have been treated. Not everybody that does irreverent acts gets struck down by God, granted. But here was an important moment in the history of God's people when the most holy thing was being taken to the capital city to once again become the center of worship in the nation. And something Uzzah did was irreverent. I think we can do the same thing with Jesus at the center. I think it's easy to talk about Jesus in ways that, that doesn't make Him the Lord of our lives, but makes Him just another pedestrian thing. I, I'm always chagrined when I hear people take Jesus' name and, and throw it around like, like it's some common, ordinary thing. Um, you hear it all the time, don't you? In dialogue all the time, you hear people say, Jesus, Christ, and they don't mean to be worshiping Jesus. I've never seen somebody struck down because they said that. But I think you and I can learn a lesson that when Jesus is the center of our life, we don't treat it lightly. This is not something that we just say and play with. Something's important. The other thing that I found in this passage that I'd never seen before is a little bit earlier in chapter 6. Notice it says in verse 3, they set out, they set the ark of God in a new cart and brought it from the house of Abinadab, which was on the hill. Uzzah and Ahio, sons of Abinadab, guiding the ark. The other thing we find out in the Bible about Uzzah is that he should have known better because for the last 20 years, 
He was living in the same house on the hill in Kiriath Jerim, where the Ark of the Covenant was in the living room. I don't know what was going on in that home. I don't know what kind of a priest or a father or an example Abinadab was, but his son, Uzzah, picked up irreverence. Imagine if you had the Ark of God in your living room. How would you treat it? Well, for 20 years, this family had the ark in their living room, and all they learned from it, as I learned from it, was to treat it lightly. Back down on the floor of the valley, David is bending over Uzzah. Know all that's been going on in the last 20 years in Abinadab's house on the hill. But he was afraid of the power of the ark. And he stood up and he said, "Uh, you remember my plan about bringing the ark to Jerusalem? Well, forget it. If this is the power of this thing, I don't want it anywhere near the capital city. And he looked around and as he looked around to try to figure out what to do, he looked over there and in the middle of the field, there was a house. And he said, whose house is that? And right there, next to where the cart was on the path to Jerusalem, along the parade route where all the people were gathered, there was a man standing there who said, it's my house, your highness. Why do you ask? And he said to the soldiers, not back to the man, take the Ark of the Covenant and put it in that man's house out there in the middle of the field. And the soldiers guided the calves, the cows with the cart behind it with the Ark of the Covenant out past the parade route into the field. And all of a sudden, this man whose name is Obed-Edom comes running around the corner and saying, "Uh, just a minute, just a minute. Um, Look, I've got little kids here in the family. Look, there's one, two, three, four. They're all going to live in that little. It's not a big house. It's a little place. Mrs. Obed-Edom was here. All the little kids were there. And the man saying, please, I just saw what happened. I don't want it in my house. And King David says, put it in the man's house. The soldiers get to the middle of the field. There's the little house that's there. They take the Ark of the Covenant off the cart. They put it in Obed-Edom's living room. They walk out and shut the door. And there in the living room is Mr. and Mrs. Obed-Edom and all little Obed-Edom standing there at attention. There's the Ark of the Covenant. They saw the whole thing. Nobody's seen this thing for 20 years. The Philistines, legend has it, didn't like it very much. It just killed a priest. What are we going to do? What do you think life was like in the Obed-Edom house that night? Wouldn't you love to have been there? You think Mr. Obed-Edom sat back and put his feet in the furniture? Oh, I don't think so. No, that might not have been what he did. Mrs. Obed-Edom went into the kitchen. Do you think she had to say, is there anybody who would like to help me tonight? No, the kids were in there. Nobody wanted to stand in the living room with the Ark of the Covenant. Afterwards, they weren't fighting about who gets the biggest piece of raisin cake. Uh, You take it. No, you take it. The Ark of the Covenant's there. (laughs) You know, there was a little farmhouse. There weren't bedrooms in the far reaches of the estate. They slept there. Oh, boy, the sleeping bags got curled up around the sides of of the place. The Ark of the Covenant is in Obed-Edom's house for three months. And for three months, this little lovely family decided that they were going to treat the presence of God with reverence and respect and thank God that this holy thing was in their lives. For three months, the spies of David were watching just outside. And they report to David that God has blessed the house of Obed-Edom and everything in the entire household because of the presence of God. What do you think the Bible means when it says God blessed everything in the household because of the presence of God? It's only all, all the Bible says. He blessed everything in the entire household. You know what I think it means? I think that means God blessed everything in the entire household. The children are growing up with bigger smiles on their faces than they had a couple months ago. My, but you're a handsome boy. What a beautiful little girl you are. The flowers in the flower pots in the windows 
had more blossoms on it than anybody else's house. God blessed everything in the entire household because of the presence of God there. The little lambs were growing and they were friskier and fluffier than anybody else's. God blessed everything in the entire household because the presence of God was there and it was treated with respect and reverence. Three months and David couldn't take it anymore. The spies came to him every day and they said, you should see this house. The, the flowers are brighter. The kids are more beautiful. The lambs are friskier. The, the lawn out in front, it's just beautiful. God's blessing it. And David said, okay, go get it. Bring it here. Let's do it. Let's bring it back here. And then he thought about it and he said, um, maybe we need to have a meeting before we do this. Oh, it's an interesting meeting. David decides that... Uh, Something has to change just a little bit. First Chronicles chapter 15. He gets together all the priests and all the Levites around him and he says, First Chronicles 15 verse 13. It was because of you, the Levites, because you did not bring it up the first time that the Lord our God broke out in anger against it. What does that mean? Whose idea was it to transport the ark on a new cart pulled by cows. It was the Philistines' idea. And when David sent the people to bring it, they did it the way the Philistines did it. Interesting. And David realizes it now. And he says to the Levites, you didn't bring it up in the prescribed way. We did not inquire of God how to do it right. And it was because of you that the anger of the Lord broke out against us. And so, verse 14, the priests and the Levites consecrated themselves in order to bring up the ark of the Lord, the God of Israel. And the Levites carried the ark of God with the poles on their shoulders as Moses had commanded in accordance with the word of God. A couple of things happened here. They consecrated themselves they carried it on their shoulders the way it was supposed to be carried. They searched the Scriptures. And then when they went after it, they went celebrating with all their might. There's only one way to carry the ark of God. Only one way. You do it, first of all, by consecrating yourself. And then you get into personal contact with the ark of God. It rests on your shoulders it's not carried the way the Philistines do it in a cart. And you search the Scriptures to make sure that you're getting it just right. And when you're comfortable that you're doing everything that God's asked you to do, then you go get the ark and you bring it back with great rejoicing. There's only one way to worship. And it's the same way that we carry the ark. Worship involves consecration. When we have worship leaders who plan our worship program together, when we have a praise team that gets up and leads the music, when, when people do the special items, when we try to figure out what passage in the Word of God we would like to look at tonight and when we, we preach, and when we come to sit and listen and worship God, there is a responsibility that you and I carry to consecrate ourselves we don't get the consecration from all the other stuff. We have to bring our consecrated selves to the worship of God. The first step we have to do. Worship is not something that just takes place in the, in the tent and camp meeting. It's, it's something that happens when you wake up in the morning. It's, it's something that's going to go on after you leave camp. And not just when you're in church, but but all week long when you get up in the morning, it's a great idea to say, God, I consecrate myself to You today. I want to worship You with everything I do. Consecration is an integral part of worship. We have to do it. I can tell that you know exactly what I'm talking about. You're shaking your head yes, you're saying amen. Even if you don't feel like consecrating yourself, you know that's what we've got to do. You know how we consecrate ourselves? We say to Jesus, take me like I am. I know I'm your child. I know you died to save me. 
I know I can't do anything to make you stop loving me. I know I can't do anything to make you love me more than I do already. Thank you what you've done for me. I am your needy child today. Make your power perfect in my weakness. That's what consecration is about. Secondly, if we're going to worship right, we need to come into personal contact with the worship of God. I'm afraid that many people believe that worship is a spectator sport. You come and you sit and you watch other people worship and you go away and you say, boy, that was good worship today. And you walk out of church or you leave the tent or you watch other people tell how much they love God and you say, man, that's, that's nice. I like that. Good for you, worshipers. And my friends, you know that worshiping is not a spectator sport. The people that are up here from night to night, the people that are on the platform in your church are merely worship leaders, but you must worship just like they do as well. It's why I'm always so saddened when, when the music seems to be so flat and dead and you, you turn around and you look into people's faces and they're, they're mouthing words that they've sung 150 times and, and the words come out and it, they don't pass through their heart. I'm not casting aspersions, please. I'm not trying to point my finger. You know what I'm talking about. It doesn't matter whether it's contemporary music or traditional music. We sing sometimes like we're dead. Sometimes it looks, if a stranger walked in and, uh, and saw us, they would wonder, is this a celebration service or a funeral that's going on? <laughs> you know, we're 21 hours ahead of California time. I uh, waited until my wife was on her lunch break today. Gave her about 15 minutes to get to wherever she was going for lunch and I called her on the phone. She picked up her cell phone and I said, Hey, are you eating out? She said, You'll never believe where I am. I'm in a funeral. <laughs> her phone's ringing. I'm sorry. I'll call you later. Sometimes church feels that way, doesn't it? Somehow worship has got to move from, from being a spectator sport into something that we come in personal contact with. Don't let the worship of Jesus be placed on a cart and paraded in front of you. Worship God by taking Jesus and putting Him on your shoulder, putting Him in your heart, putting Him in your mind and your soul, and making personal contact with Jesus. That's what worship is about. That's the only way to worship. If we're going to worship like we're supposed to, our worship has to be based on the Bible. David said to the priests and the Levites, search the words of Moses. Make sure you know exactly how we're supposed to do this. And you and I must always find that our worship is Bible-based. We're not going to find a list of appropriate songs in the Bible. We're not going to find any principles that say you can play the song this fast, you can't play it that fast. But the principles of abiding worship are there and they will be there for you to find if you will search for them. I've been reading the Bible for many, many years and I find every time I open to a story, I find something I never saw before. I read the story of David and Uzzah and the ark dozens of times. I never understood it before. And when I began to see the picture, suddenly it quit bothering me so much. And I'm able to praise God even in the story of Uzzah now. The Bible is open before us. My dad, who was not a, a spiritual man, had a Bible that he left with me. And in the front of the Bible, he wrote something that I'll never forget. He said, the person who does not read has no advantage over the person who cannot read. Isn't that good? Imagine what happens when the Bible that has the presence of Jesus in it, the power of the Holy Spirit in our life, sits in our living room for 20 years and we don't treat it like it ought to be treated. Imagine what it's like. Don't you know how badly Jesus wants us to open His Word and find the beauty of His face in the Word? Absolutely important to do it. 
And finally, just like what the people did when they brought the Ark of the Covenant to Jerusalem, how important it is when we worship to celebrate with all of our might, not half-heartedly. This is a wonderful thing that we get to do to worship God. It's going to be what we do throughout the ages of eternity. Ten million years from tonight, we're going to be worshiping God. Why don't we try it tonight too? Why do we wait until we get there? Let's do it. Do I have five more minutes? Is it okay, Eddie? Let me say a couple of things. I don't want to get real specific. The Bible just doesn't have specifics about worship. The principles are there. And I'm going to trust that you will read it with all your heart and find the application for your life. But I do want to say a couple of things because already in the half a week that I've been here, somebody here and there has noticed that tonight we're going to be talking about the only way to worship. And several people have said to me, are you going to talk about raising your hands in worship? Are you going to talk about clapping your hands in worship? And are you going to talk about drums in worship? And I'm not. Well, let me say a couple things, okay? I'm, I'm going to try to suggest a couple of principles. I know that you have unique situations in your congregations, in, in the issues that have been raised in this part of the world. I know that they're heavy on many people's hearts. And I don't want you to think in any way that I'm being flippant with this with this whole idea of what's appropriate in worship or not. If you'll let me talk about some specifics the next couple nights, if it's on your heart, I'll be do it. I'll be glad to do it. But let me just say a couple of things. First of all, about raising your hands. I don't think it's wrong not to raise your hand in worship. Thank you for listening real carefully there. I don't think it's wrong not to raise your hand in worship. The Bible is very clear. Lift up your hands in the sanctuary. We don't, many of us Adventists, don't raise our hands, not because it's not appropriate in biblical worship, but because our culture has stinted our growth in this way a little bit. Um, when I moved to Southern California from the East Coast, there was a church called Celebration Center that we'd been hearing about for a long time. My family was so curious. And one Sabbath, we said, we don't have any responsibilities in church. Let's go over to Celebration Center. And it was packed, and we sat in two different rows. Uh, our kids were in front of Karen and me. And in the middle of the singing, uh, man, everybody in the church was raising their hand and praising God that way. And my little boy, who was about 11 years old, he watched everybody raising their hands, singing. He looked at Dad, and he said, uh, What's going on here? I said, well, they're praising God by raising your hands. Just like the Bible says, raise your hand, lift up your hands in the sanctuary. And Ben looked this way and he looked that way and he leaned back and he said, Dad, is it okay if I do that? I said, absolutely. You go ahead and do it. So he waited until the next song started. It got going. People started raising their hand. Ben raised his hand. It went like this. He got it up about this, and I said, that's my son. That's my son. <laughs> you know, I am so culturally conditioned, I just can't do it. And I want to. I want to. But I don't know. I'm self-conscious. I just, I don't know. And I don't know if I'll ever do it. In heaven, I know I'll do it. I, I'd love to do it. If you see me, don't laugh at me, will you? If I don't know how to do it, but I don't do it. You know, uh, Ben and I, the next summer, were in Rome and we were visiting the catacombs. And way down in the lower level of one of the catacombs, we came across a mosaic picture entitled Young Man in Prayer, a mosaic that had been created in the first century. And this young man was standing there with his hands up to God like that. First century Christian. Oh, friends, it's good to lift your hands to God. And if you can break out of the cultural confinements, do it. But it's also okay not to do it. Please don't criticize those of us who haven't learned how to do it yet. Okay? Second thing I want to say is about clapping your hands in church. I don't think it's wrong not to clap in church. 
I think that, that the Bible is clear when it says things like, clap your hands, all you people. Shout unto God with a voice of triumph. I'll never forget, I was doing a youth ministry training session in uh, state in the States and uh, we had a, a song for church. So we were at an academy site. There were a lot of youth leaders in and there were the academy students were there. And it was one of those songs that go like, uh, the trees of the fields will clap their hand. You know that one, something like that. I don't remember exactly. And everybody, almost everybody, we got to that point and they clapped their hands a couple of times. We had workshops all afternoon and then finally that evening we had a debriefing session where I asked all the leaders to write down what they thought of the session, how could we make it better. And I looked over on the other side of the, of the room where we were doing this and there was a man that was standing there with his arms folded and, and he, just, um, he just was looking at me, kind of shaking his head. And finally he walked across and uh, I said, uh, how are you? I introduced myself and he said, I got to tell you, this was the worst youth ministry training session I've ever been to. Well, you know that hurts when you tried your best and somebody says something like that. And um, I said, tell me what it was that we did wrong. And he said, well, it was church service. I said, specifically, what was it? And he said, it was that song. Which song? The one where you had everybody clapping their hands. I said, really? What's the matter with that? And he said, oh, it's evil to clap your hands in church and worship. I tell my students all the time, don't clap your hands in church. You can't do it. It's wrong. I, I said, excuse me, but what would happen if your students accidentally come across the psalm that says, clap your hands, all you people. Shout unto God with a voice of triumph. I'll never forget what he said to me. He looked me straight in the eye and he said, David didn't know all there was to know about worship. Isn't that amazing? He did, but David didn't. <laughs> It was amazing. It seems to me that there is a, a Philistine way of doing this, and it's to admit the way that I do it is the only right way to do it. Whatever you're doing is wrong. I think it's okay, though, not to clap in worship. And please, if, if you're clapping, <laughs> you, you do awfully well here. I also have a morning meeting in the big tent this morning after I finished my my sermon, there were uh, three or four of you, I wouldn't be surprised if you're here tonight, sitting over here that began to clap and nobody else applauded. <laughs> and I'm saying, it's not wrong not to applaud. If we can't do it, if our culture, our tradition has told us not to do it, let's, let's say it's okay, all right? Whether you do it or not, it's a cultural thing. It's no scriptural indication that we shouldn't do it. One more thing. I don't think it's wrong not to play drums in worship. Uh, I know there are a lot of people that think without drums is the only way to worship. I want to tell you that obviously there is no scriptural passage that says that playing drums and electric guitar is not right in worship. Obviously we're not going to find that in the Bible. We do find principles of worship. Is it important that you can hear me now or not? I don't know. Something's going on here. Here's what I think the biblical principle is. Musicians and worship leaders and preachers and worshipers in the pews come to worship to, glor to glorify God and not glorify themselves. You okay with that? And the principle of glorifying Jesus in our worship and not glorifying ourselves is for drummers and guitarists and people that play the trumpet and people that play the harp and people that play an organ and people that play a piano. And it's for worship leaders and planners and it's for preachers as well. What we do in worship is to glorify Jesus, not glorify ourselves. I don't know if you've ever met with a group of musicians just before they come out to lead us in worship. If you've heard the heartfelt praise and uh, prayer to God, help us to glorify you. I can't say to them, your particular instrument doesn't glorify God. That's not a biblical position. The biblical position is let's glorify Jesus and not ourselves. But if somebody thinks that it's not appropriate, 
Let's let him think that. Please be kind to us who are older and, and uh, come from a different culture or come from a different tradition. Friday night, I'm going to talk about the one Christian standard. And I'll give you a clue right now. It's not about music. It's not about what we eat. It's not about what we wear. It's about the way we treat each other. And if you'll be here Friday night, I want you to know that it's the highest expectation that God has for us. You be patient with everybody that has to worship, okay? But make sure in your own worship that it is done from a consecrated heart, from a deepening personal connection with God, that it's based in the Bible, and that you celebrate worship with all your might. God bless you as you worship. Amen.